I truly feel fortunate to be back here. The, the Centre on Aging is a, is a fantastic place uh, in which to conduct my research. My, my colleagues there, as well as in the Department of Psychology, are uh, truly top rate. In terms of the things that, that I want to, to touch on here today, I'm not so certain that any of them are going to be earth shattering in any way, shape or form. And uh, I think many uh, who understand psychology would just say it's the science of uh, adding fancy labels to what is otherwise common sense. And uh, nonetheless, uh, you'll, you'll bear with me. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the demographic shift, the fact that uh, as a country and as a continent, we're living longer in Canada, we're living longer in North America, but uh, along with that comes a downside as well. We typically have a greater disease burden, for example, if we're living until 90 rather than 80, and that has implications for one of the things that I study in particular, which is memory and how it changes as we get older. I also, uh, and this is more for self-serving purposes, want to talk a little bit about intervention research that's hot in the literature right now. And that's because I, I probably field about 35 phone calls a week related to people asking me questions and whether they should buy this or whether they should do that. And uh, I'm hoping, and again, it'll be my biased opinion, but I'm hoping to give you um, uh, some tips and insights in terms of the types of things that you can do to maintain your cognitive as well as your physical health. Shamelessly, I'm also going to talk a little bit about a new study that uh, Dr. Holly Tuco and myself and Vinay Bradia uh, and, and a whole host uh, of collaborators and wonderful grad students in my lab are just starting. And it really is focusing on early detection of people at risk for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, as I'm going to talk about in a few moments here, while we understand uh, the tip of the iceberg, I would say, in terms of Alzheimer's disease, we, one thing we know for sure is that it starts many years before you first see the behavioral deficits. And if we can identify early indicators, we have at least a fighting chance of prescribing some effective interventions that may buy all of us, um, at least those of us at risk of the disease, some more time. And finally, as I, as I promised, minimizing my risk. My guess is that for most of you, this will probably be the section uh, of my overview that you'll be most interested in. Concrete things that you can actively engage in that aren't going to cost you a lot of money. For the most part, you're going to enjoy anyways and really can make a difference. It's never too late to start. And some of these things we can't control, but some of these risk factors are firmly within your control. Most talks uh, launch right into things. I want uh, to start with two brief asides here. Uh, I'm going to do my level best to not use uh, a lot of jargon that we typically do in psychology, for example, or cognitive aging. Um, and the second aside I'll get to in a moment. But cognition itself derives from a Latin term. In terms of what I'm going to talk about today, you're going to hear me, for the most part, talk about changes in memory, and you're going to hear me talk about dementia or Alzheimer's disease in particular. But cognition is much broader than just remembering, and I've listed out uh, a few things here. It involves being able to attend uh, to stimuli in our environment, uh, it has to do with problem solving or, or forming intent. Uh, it has to do with making decisions, financial decision making, for example, in our everyday lives. All of these things are examples of, of cognitive function. And from the perspective of successful aging, um, I'm going to emphasize too, in keeping with the title of the talk, Successful aging involves many components, and I would say no one of us um, does them all uh, exceedingly well, and some of them we have virtually no control over. We don't have control over our current chronological age. We don't have control necessarily over our genetic makeup, but we certainly have control over our behaviors and uh, our lifestyle and our exposure to specific risk factors. And so I'm uh, largely going to be talking about things that we can do something about as opposed to perseverating on the things that we can't do much about. And I hope, uh, I hope that'll please most. 
The other thing I, I want to talk about, I did use the term successful aging, but I always get this critique when I'm having these sorts of public talks. People come up to me after and they, um, well, they almost infer that I'm uh, ageist uh, of sorts because these sorts of talks tend to differentially focus on declines rather than gains, on disease rather than celebrating successes and so on. And there, uh, it's a whole different talk, it's a whole different series of talks, but there's a very rich literature on the dynamics or the balance between gains and losses as we all age. And the truth is, and this plot shows it, here's birth, uh, we can roughly say that this is death, and as you go along this continuum, yes, it's true that the proportion of gains are smaller and the proportion of losses are greater, but aging is a dynamic process. And um, despite uh, the popular opinion of the average 20-year-old on the street, uh, there are an awful lot of um, important facets of aging that they do not yet uh, possess or haven't had the pleasure yet of, of experiencing. Expertise, wisdom, acculturated knowledge, these things take a lifetime of experience and perspective to properly understand. So I'm just trying to, to circumvent that criticism at this juncture as well. Okay, um, so when you look at the popular literature, uh, I, I think you might have a tendency to think that the sky is falling in terms of the, the so-called graying of society. You don't have to look very far in terms of various forms of popular media to see titles such as Baby Boomer Healthcare Crisis Looms, Demographics, Aging and Healthcare, Is There a Crisis? So whether we're talking about healthcare, or whether we're talking about cognition in general. Uh, I've only been in this field for about 10 or 15 years, and it would seem that about every two or three years we kind of move a decade earlier in terms of how soon memory impairments are starting to rear their ugly head. And uh, the truth is, is there's multiple different types uh, of memory. And some types of memory, such as vocabulary, for example, improve well into the seventh decade uh, of life um, or uh, sometimes beyond. Whereas other types of cognitive functioning, such as ability to, to reason, uh, that requires a lot of mental energy, these things do start showing declines. Uh, I would argue not in the 20s, <laughs> but I would certainly say by the, the late 30s or, uh, or into the, the 40s. Anyways, uh, the sky, in fact, is, uh, is not falling, but what I can say definitively is that Canada is aging. We, we are a country that experienced a, a big spike in terms of birth uh, following the, the Second World War. I think fully one-third of the population almost falls within that demographic, and the projections are by uh, about 25 uh, years or so from now that 10 million Canadians wholly are going to be 65 years or older. And uh, this is something to be celebrated, and it's also something that we need to, to start planning for because as uh, our society is aging, of course, chronological age and disease uh, tend to move in lockstep together. And here is one brief graphic that shows the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, and it in fact doubles about every five years. I show this, though, because I think people have uh, a fear of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease itself, but oftentimes when we're talking about the risk for such diseases, for cancer, for cardiovascular disease and so on, the base rates of these diseases are never really reported. So we're, we're meant to be or made to be afraid of it, but you can see here, for example, between the ages of about 65 and 75 years, there's only a 1 in 40 chance that any one individual in this room, for example, would potentially be afflicted with, with Alzheimer's disease. So we're talking around 2%. And by the time you get into the 75 to 85 range, we're talking about a one in nine possibility. So it increases to about 10%. And the fastest growing age bracket in Canada is the age 85 plus, a testament to healthy living, I would say, as well as a testament to healthcare in many respects. The, uh, the prevalence of, of dementia or Alzheimer's disease in that age strata, 85 years and older, is about one in, in three, and some studies suggest uh, one in, in two. 
Now, what does that mean in terms of concrete numbers for us? So today, if we look in the population, there's about 1.5% of Canadians who have some form of dementia, and within about the next 30 years, that value is basically going to be double. We'll be at about 30%. And to put that in perspective, today, about every five minutes, we have a new case of dementia that would be diagnosed. And in 30 years, in 2038, that'll be about every two minutes, um, which, at least in my mind, uh, seems pretty substantial. And it's, it's not just a, a disease, obviously, that's going to affect the individual. It's going to affect uh, loved ones. It's going to affect caregivers, and it's, it, it, it hasn't yet, but it, I shouldn't say that, it has to a certain extent, but we're, have to go, we're going to have to get very serious about the way it affects public policy. And you can see here this slide, these are estimates in billions of dollars of what the cost of caring for individuals with dementia will be in Canada in the coming decades. So 10 years from now, we're talking about 200 billion. 20 years from now, we're talking about 500 billion. And 30 years from now, we're talking about 800 billion, and those estimates do not include approximately 300 billion dollars that would be attributed uh, to the costs associated with caregiver burden, uh, health uh, issues, stress, and so on that, that our loved ones would be experiencing uh, while helping us through this process. So, uh, not a doomsday scenario. There are many countries in the world who are much, much older than Canada right now. Italy, Sweden, Japan, they've faced these challenges. There are uh, at least some models in place that I think uh, we can learn from, and in fact, some of those comparisons and research is, uh, is ongoing right now. I'll come back to this policy thing uh, a little later. I'd like a, a brief show of hands in, uh, in this room. If I told you that some usual suspects or risk factors for Alzheimer's disease included diet or nutrition, uh, medications, relative health, uh, your social or economic uh, factors that, that you live under on a daily basis, or environmental exposures, the type of lifestyle that you lead, are you active, are you mentally engaged, how many people actually think that these would be risk factors for Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, and this is, this is the, the typical response, and the National Institutes of Health in the United States completely disagrees. They suggest that there is, on balance, zero evidence that any of these modifiable risk factors are a causal, or, or show a causal link with the dementia process. And I just wanted to raise that point because this has got a lot of press in the last year or so. The truth is, is that, that it's almost semantics. It's related to the rigor of the science in the dementia field. Because we're, we're dealing with a human population as opposed to uh, mice, for example, in a lab, um, it's, uh, it's a very delicate situation. There are lots of things that you can't ethically experimentally manipulate. The, the National Institutes of Health's concern is that the science simply isn't up to snuff uh, to date to claim that any one of these modifiable risk factors causes Alzheimer's disease. 